Amen. I just realized they're waiting on me. Uh, they, it wasn't a sound malfunction. They're waiting on me. Welcome this morning to Cornerstone Church. How are you today? Happy Mother's Day. If you're a mom in the house, would you just stand up? Just If you're a mom in the house, come on, stand up. Give it up for all the moms in the place. Thank you so much for all that you do. We wouldn't be here without you in lots of different ways. So thank you so much. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day all day today. And uh, just be, be blessed and know that you're loved and prayed for. Hey, let's us, uh, we're, I'm not going to have you stand because we're going to go right into video announcements. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you and we thank you so very, very much for who you are. And Lord, we ask you this Mother's Day, God, that you would pour out your anointing and your blessing upon our moms. And Father, thank you for who they are and how they pray and how they love. And Jesus, we just ask, God, that you would just be in our worship this morning, that you would speak to us, talk to us. Father, be with us as we go about this service. In your mighty name we pray, and Cornerstone Church says, amen. amen. What do you guys love about your mom? <laughs> my favorite thing about my mom probably is always her, like, positive energy that she gives us. Um... Like for me, especially when I'm dancing, she always comes backstage with me before I have to compete. So she's really like, gives me a good build up before I have to go on stage and like sends positive energy. My favorite thing about my mom is that she's always there for me whenever I need her. She's really nice and she, she always loves us and thinks it's great that she's always driving us to and from church and taking the time to care for us. Taking us out for dinner and getting us presents. My mom's nice. She helps us when we need help. And she um, takes care of us really well. She provides us with all our needs and she's very loving and caring. My favorite thing is that no matter what we've done or like what we're going through, she's always right there to just love on us. So even when we have a bad dream or we Disobey her, she's still right there and loves us. Kanan, what do you love about your mom? Snuggling. Snuggling? <laughs> what do you like to do with mom? What do you and mom do? Shoes. Yeah? Shoes. Shoes? No, shoes. Oh, okay. Well, she does a lot of nice, kind things to us. Like, she always is, like, doing dishes a lot and when we really don't want to. That's most of the thing. We really it's basically all the dishes. I love that um, she just um, is just really nice all the time and that she's always thinking of other people. Well, she does a lot of things for us. Uh, she's amazing. She loves us very much and she goes and brings us a lot of to a lot of places. She gives me a lot of hugs and she brings us to the grocery store. Um, she matches all the time. She matches sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Come on, Cornerstone, get to your feet and begin to praise the Lord Jesus. What do you guys love about your mom? Somebody shout to the Lord.
There's no stopping the power of Jesus Christ. He's moving in our midst, church, and he won't stop now. Jesus. You're on a journey. You're on a journey, Christian. God has taken you on that journey. And according to the book of Philippians, he who's begun this journey with you, he's not stopping until the journey's done. How many of you need a God who's going to stick with you every step of the way? How many of you need a God who you know is on the step with you right now? I give you glory for all you brought me through. Yes, Lord. Now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward. Do you believe 
the breakthrough is coming, because I sure do. church, I just sense that the Lord is saying something to our hearts here this morning. He's opening doors, and we have to be faithful to walk through them. So often, Lord, the doors that the Lord opens to us take us, they're not the doors that we were planning on, they're not the doors that we thought, but you know what, they're the doors that God has decided we should walk through, and we don't need to be afraid of that to just, uh, I got some doors right now that God's opening in my life, and they're not doors that I ever thought I'd be at, and uh, I'm at thresholds that I never thought I'd be at, but God has me in a place where he's saying, here's your door, walk through it, don't be afraid, just walk through it, Jesus, your presence is an open door. you God isn't about yesterday's wine. In Pentecost, there's an old saying that yesterday we can't live on yesterday's oil. We can't live on yesterday's anointing. We've got to step into today. We need oil for today. We need new wine for today. And if we're going to minister in our generation, we need the new wine. Listen to this song. In the 
Spirit Israel is speaking in this place today. He's moving in powerful ways. I trust that uh, as Pastor Jen brings the word today, he's going to just really bring some revelation to our hearts. You can be seated this morning as you prepare your heart for Holy Communion. Jesus, bring new wine. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. You know, that's the prayer of many of our hearts. Do something new. Bring revival. That's what we mean when we sing the song. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Revive our souls. Revive our church. Restore, renew, rebuild. Give us something new. Give us something fresh. Give us something We come to that place right now in our church service where we're taking what's called Holy Communion. Love those words, Holy Communion. The word holy means separated, dedicated to. And of course, communion is a word we know real well. It's, 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 while it's usually used in a religious term, it, it comes from the word community. And it's about us as Christians being bound together as one body and also being bound together with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's this great passage in the book, uh, Song of Solomon, that says, I belong to my beloved, and he belongs to me. His banner over me is love. And that's a picture of us belonging to Jesus and Jesus belonging to us. As the body of Christ, we are one with Jesus Christ. And not only that, we are one with each other. Holy Communion is an opportunity for us to remind ourselves that we are a people who are dedicated to a sacred community with each other and with Jesus Christ. You see, that's what it means, Holy Communion, dedicated community with each other and with God. Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 said, every time we get together as a church and practice communion, we ought to be mindful of the body of Christ. And some of them, some of us have taken that to mean this little cup of juice and this little piece of bread, that that's the body of Christ. But how many of you know that that is not the body or the blood of Jesus Christ? Those are symbols of that thing. But the body of Jesus Christ is sitting here in these seats today. At least that's what Paul the Apostle said throughout his letters to the Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Galatians. He said that we sitting here in the pews are the body of Christ. And he is our living head. He's the brains of the operation. And we are the body joined together. And Paul the Apostle said, every time we take communion, we ought to be mindful of the body of Christ, the community which we have been joined to by our salvation. See, that becomes problematic for us as people because we're, we're natural joiners, but we're not generally natural stickers. We love to join. How, how many of you have ever joined something and then dropped out after week two? Right? We're natural joiners, but we're not natural stickers. 
And that's why Jesus instituted Holy Communion and why one of the things, he didn't tell us how often to take it. We take it once a month. Some churches take it every week. You know why? Because it's an opportunity to remind you that you're supposed to stick with this thing. Come hell or high water, you're supposed to stick with this thing. No matter what, you're supposed to stick with the body of Christ. That becomes problematic when we run into things like new wine. Because new wine, as much as we pray for it, and as much as we cry for it, as much as we say we want it, see, new wine requires new wineskins. New wineskins create bumps in the process, in the rhythm of our lives. How many of you like it when your rhythm is broken up a little bit? I know I don't. I don't like it when my rhythm's interrupted. I don't like it when things don't go, when I have my little book and, and everything in my little book doesn't go according to its schedule, right? And you know what? New wine does that. It takes us out of our rhythm. It takes us out of our, it takes us out of our path, out of our way, and it causes bumps in the pathway. But can I just tell you, can I just tell you, we need the new wine. We need it in order to be effective. This month we're taking communion, holy communion, dedicated community. If there's one thing I can encourage you in, it's don't let the bumps in the process, don't let the new wine and the new wine skin that God is trying to provide for you cause you so much consternation that you forget what you're here for. Don't let whatever it is that's going on in your family life or your personal life or your church life get so in the way of you uh, connecting that you forget what Jesus sent you here for. We've all got stuff. Some of it's big stuff, some of it's little stuff. The stuff that you think is a big deal, I probably think is a little deal, and the stuff that I think is a big deal, you're probably like, Pastor Jay, get over it. The point is, is that we've all got our stuff that we can turn to and look at and say, that's a real problem. But God hasn't called us to be problem solvers. He's called us to be He's called us to be servants. He's called us to join to the body of Christ, and he's called us to let him be the problem solver. Let him be the way maker. We aren't the brains of the operation. I'm not the brains of the operation. Jesus is. I'm just whatever little part of the body I'm supposed to be. I'm an eye or a nose or a, you know, depends on the day sometimes, whether I'm, you know, watching things carefully or blowing snot out all over everything. Is, is, well, if you're a nose, <laughs> here's the truth. He called us to just be our part. Stop struggling and to just sit back and relax and be the part of the body we were made to be. So, as we take Holy Communion today, I want you to remember that what it is it's a time we dedicate to recommitting ourselves to this thing we call church and to this Savior we call Jesus. I'm going to pray for you now, and as I pray before I, uh, I, I, I say the words, I'm going to pray that God helps you in whatever way you need to, and He knows, whatever way you need to, to reconnect, to recommit, to rededicate yourself to this community, this holy community between each other and our God. Lord Jesus, you see each heart. There's nothing hidden from you. There's lots that's hidden from me. And there's lots that we hide from each other, but there's nothing that's hidden from you. You see everything. You see everything that helps and everything that hinders us coming together as the body of Christ and us coming together with you to worship you. Jesus, you died on the cross to deal with those things that get in the way. And so, Jesus, right now, I release you into my brothers and sisters in this room. I pray, Lord God, that whatever stands in the way, you would push aside. You would deal with by the power and the authority of your blood. I pray that you would make my brothers and my sisters, I pray that you would make me submissive to the work of your hand. Lord, so often we resist that which you're trying to do. 
we get our backs up, we get our, 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 our shoulders scrunched and our minds dead set against what it is you're trying to do and we hinder the move of God in our lives. And I pray right now we would not do that. But I pray that your Holy Spirit would just come in and breathe peace over us. Breathe relaxation over us. Breathe joy over us. Breathe love over us. And I pray that all those barricades to holy communion would be removed. And I pray that every brother and sister in this room would find themselves able, able to dedicate them once themselves once again to you and to the body you place on them. No matter how big or how small the issue is, Lord, move it out of the way so that we can reconnect. We so need to do this on a regular basis, and we do it now. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body, or symbolizes my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat together. Let's take now. Lord, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you that it was broken for us, that you were broken for us, that you took the stripes upon your back so that we could walk in health, spiritual, emotional, and physical health. We release that over ourselves, over our brothers and sisters right now. I pray that this would become one of the healthiest places in the world, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. In the same way, after supper, Jesus poured out the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new agreement, the new testament in my blood. Every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do remember my death until I come back to take you unto myself. Let's drink together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you not only died for us, you rose from the grave for us to break the power of sin over our lives. More than that, you ascended to the right hand of God the Father in heaven, where even this morning, as we pray to you, you are praying to the Father for us, each and every individual. I don't know how you do that in real time, but you are doing that, Lord God. You are praying for everyone in this room, every man, woman, and child in this room. Not only that, Jesus, but you're just waiting. Your hand is at the door, and you're waiting for the trumpet call of the, heart, the archangel. And when that trumpet is sounded, you will open the door, and you will come, and you will call us back to yourself. We know that that is true, and we await that day, Lord Jesus. And until then, your body here on earth works for you and builds the kingdom together for you. And we allow you to lead us in that work. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing this song with the ladies.
gonna lift my hands. still under your feet. Lord, we thank you, God, that, Lord, though the uh, things around us don't make a whole lot of sense sometimes, Lord, you uh, are the giver of good gifts, and you are the endowment of wisdom and power and strength and mercy. And so this morning, God, we just worship you. Come on, church, one more time. Just lift your voice. Just lift your voice and tell him how much you love him this morning. Come on, somebody, worship him a little bit more. Come on, somebody, get a little bit more excited about him. Father, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. Come on, Mike Honig, worship him on those drums, brother. Come on. Come on, Mike, just play. Just, just, just sing unto the Lord with those sticks, Mike.
thank you for who you are because you're awesome in power and awesome in might. Lord, we love you this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. And all of Cornerstone Church says amen and amen. Hey, find somebody that you didn't come to church with this morning. And give them a hug. Love on them. If they're a mom, wish them happy Mother's Day. If they're a dad, say, man, I'm glad you got a good mom, all right? Uh, come on, somebody. Moving around, moving around. Amen, amen. Go ahead and find your seats this morning. Hey, we got a couple special things that are going to happen here in the next few moments. And uh, so you might you might call this a service of videos. I feel like I'm in a deja vu moment. Maybe I've said that once or twice before. Uh, but before we go there, uh, man, we've got three $25 gift cards to Kimball's. And we just want to celebrate uh, some moms out here. Uh, Beth, where are you? There you are. You were ducking down. Beth, we just want to say uh, hap uh, happy Mother's Day. And you take the kids out for some ice cream on Cornerstone Church. Give it up for Beth. Come on. Amen. Amen. Uh, man, Denise Croto, I know you hate Kimball's, so I know you're going to struggle. You can give that to Bobby for Happy Father's Day, all right? So, uh, man, that works out just great. And, hey, how about this? Cindy Baker. Go ahead and stand up, Cindy. Stand up. Show everybody your badge. Come on, turn around. Come on. Uh, look at there. All right, we're celebrating you this morning, Cindy, uh, as you go through the first of several holidays in your new world. But we love you, and we're glad your boys are around you, amen, because they give you strength, and it's just awesome. Hey, we're going to take up this morning's offering, and I just want to say thank you so, so very much for your continued faithfulness in all uh, that we do here at Cornerstone, whether it's just regular uh, tithes and offerings that you give into Cornerstone, or whether it's uh, missions that you give on the first week of every month, or any point during, and we just want to say thanks so much for all that you do. Ushers, if you'll come on down and, and get ready to prepare. I, I, I'm reminded this morning of God's faithfulness because uh, my mom passed away about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, and uh, I remember the day that I got the news that my mom passed away, and I was like shell-shocked. I don't know if you've ever, if you've lost a parent or you lost a child or you lost a spouse, you know, you know what that feeling's like. And uh, I, I remember as we got in the car to leave, to head to uh, uh, Nebraska from Memphis, and my wife was driving because I just couldn't even focus. I remember my best friend in the whole world outside of my wife, he called and he said this. He goes, I will do whatever you need me to do. And I said, you would. He goes, if you need me to be at your mom's funeral, I'm there. I said, no, nah, man, I, I, I get it, bro. You got your world. You're doing your things. He goes, I just want you to know it's not ever too late to call. It's not too late to text. It's not too late. Can I just say this morning that Jesus is just like that? It's never too late with him. Five of you grabbing onto that promise. It's never too late with him, is it not? It's never too late. And so, Jesus, we just thank you this morning that it's never too late. It's never too late. If you're tithing or giving this morning, would you hold up uh, your envelope and would you just, let's just pray. Father, we thank you that you are faithful and, God, that you are never too late. Uh, Lord, that you never are not going to be there. Lord Jesus, that you are never not going to answer when we call. And, Lord, today we say thank you for your provision. We say thank you for how you love us. Thank you for how you take care of of us. In the mighty name of Jesus, Cornerstone Church says amen and amen. Thank you, ushers, for serving us this morning. Hey, we got a special offertory this morning. We don't do offertories every Sunday around here at Cornerstone, but we got a special treat. Uh, some of our kids want to talk to us, so give your attention to the screens this morning. What do you guys love about your mom? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing about my mom probably is always her like positive energy that she gives us. Um, like for me, especially when I'm dancing, she always comes backstage with me before I have to compete. So she's really like gives me a good build up before I have to go on stage and like sends positive energy. My favorite thing about my mom is that she's always there for me whenever I need her. She's really nice and she, she always loves us and I think it's great that she's always driving us to and from church 
and taking the time to care for Zach, are we to think that the same thing's going to happen to our other video? You know? All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll plow through. Zach, if you'll send me a message there, I'll, I'll know what to do. Hey, this is an awesome Sunday for us. I just want to say uh, a special thank you to Pastor Jen, my wife, my kids' as mom. Uh, she's going to be speaking the word to us this morning. Would you give a round of applause to the what we think is the greatest mom in all the land, Pastor Jen? Thanks, babe. I was wondering how long the Koto girls are going to be on the screen with that. I'm sure you guys are loving that, right? I know you are happy about that. Don't lie. Especially Olivia. Right? I know, I know. <laughs> Jesus, thank you so much for today, God. Thank you uh, for your presence in this place, Jesus. Thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, God. And we are so grateful for that, God, because you are usually a hot mess, and we don't even know what we're doing half the time. So thank you for being consistent, Father. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray, amen. Happy Mother's Day. Thanks. I just said that so you all would say it to me. No, I'm good. <laughs> I'm trying to, like, regroup for a second. So this is me regrouping because I was planning on two videos. And then Pastor Dan goes, welcome my wife. I was like, okay. Then the Bible says something about being, like, ready in season and out. Okay, so this is me ready. All right, um, so we are going to read some scripture today. You guys okay with that? Because... Scripture's good, right? All right, cool. So we're going to start off in 1 Samuel. I believe it's on the screens. If not, you can get out your Bibles, and we're going to read. There was a man, and his name was Elkanah, who lived in Ramah, in the hill country of Ephraim. He was a son of a bunch of, well, not a bunch of people, just this one guy, but I don't know how to say his name, Jeroham, and grandson of Elihu from the family of Tote. Do you guys ever read the Bible and go, what? Okay, good. So it's not just the pastor. Does that make you feel good? Okay, cool. Because that's how I feel. Like if somebody's like, yeah, I don't get that. I don't really know what, how to pronounce that. And they're like a scholar. I'm just like, I don't need this. So we're going to skip over to um, Hannah's, Hannah's prayer. So first of all, before we do that, I want to say, I'm just going to like kind of skim through this real quick. I give you just kind of a backdrop. Okay, so here Hannah and Ephraim, okay, they're, they're husband and wife, right? But Ephraim also has another wife. I'm sorry, not Ephraim. That's the son of. So Elihu, and he has another wife, okay? So he's got two wives. One can have babies and one cannot. Hannah cannot. Any, I, I walk through not being able to have children, so I don't know if anybody else maybe has that testimony or has walked through that or is struggling and life feels like it's really unfair. So not only was Hannah walking through this particular situation of not being able to have children, but she also had a woman that she lived with, which was her husband's other wife. So think about that for a hot second. And this woman could have children, and this woman verbally abused Hannah. She made fun of Hannah because she couldn't have children. So for any of you who have the testimony of walking through a difficult time of not being to have children and then adding this on top of that, I can't even imagine. I think I probably would have smothered her in her sleep. And then I would have repented. Did a burnt offering or something. Yeah, I might get in trouble for that later. Um, so uh, that would be really, really hard for me, right? Like that would be really hard to, I don't throw peanuts at me. No, listen, no peanuts. I hear you. No peanuts. We have a joke in staff. I'm going to tell him now. So we have this joke um, because sometimes my husband says things that are really inappropriate yeah, come on, go ahead. Y'all know it's true. So listen, so in staff meeting one day, he was saying that, and we had these peanuts on the table, and I was like, we, you need to eat more peanuts. Stop talking, because you're like peanuts, you can't talk when you have peanuts in your mouth. Y'all look at me like I lost my mind. I promise, this is a real thing. Anyway, so now, when somebody says something that is probably shouldn't have been said, we're like, you, you, we need to throw peanuts at you. No? Okay. Guess we'll keep that amongst the staff. Sorry. Sorry I brought you into that little world. <laughs> So here is Hannah, and um, this woman, uh, Pan Panina, Panina, isn't that like a famous person, Panina wedding dresses? Um, so anyways, she was making fun of Hannah, and Hannah got to this place where she was crying out to God, and she was crying out so intensely to the Lord that um, the priest thought that she was drunk. 
Have you ever been so passionate about something in your life that somebody thought you were a little crazy? You sure? Was it a good passion? Would you have been that passionate about something that maybe mattered, maybe didn't? Do sometimes we get really passionate about stuff that really has no eternal value? Do we get on social media and tell everybody about it? Yes, we do. Don't lie. <laughs> yes, you do. And if you don't have social media, then you tell, you call up your best friend and you vent, right? We get really passionate about stuff that whether we can't control or we need to be on our knees praying about it, not telling Facebook about it or Snapchat about it, students, or our best friend about it, or we could go on, right? We get so passionate about stuff that doesn't really matter. But here Hannah was crying out for a child. I would say that mattered. And that was something that was very personal for her. And I, I find it funny that even her husband said, Hannah, what's the matter? <laughs> Who said stupid? <laughs> Coach. Thank you for saying that so I didn't have to. No, I was playing. Um, so so she, oh, do you ever feel like you walk stuff by yourself? Especially, I think, as women. I know men, you do too. Um, but I, th I feel like sometimes, and correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like sometimes with men it's like, that sucked. Okay, we're good now. And with women, it sometimes goes a little deeper. And sometimes we just have to, like, get it out there and we have to say it. And when people don't really want to hear us saying it, like, I don't mean, like, the social media stuff. I mean, like, your husband in this situation or maybe it's a best friend or you kind of feel like you're completely alone and you have nobody to go to. I know I've been in situations in my own life where you just feel alone. And maybe your spouse is there for you. Maybe your best friend is there for you. Obviously, we know that God is always there for us, but you still feel alone. I would imagine Hannah felt a little alone. All she desired was to be a mom. Her husband didn't really understand. The priest thought she was a hot mess and drunk. <laughs> right? So maybe your pastor doesn't understand. The, the woman who is supposed to be close to you and is supposed to get your back and is supposed to be living life with you does, is making fun of you. And so now you're walking this journey all by yourself. Hannah was walking this journey all by herself. And even as she pleaded and cried out to Jesus, to God, people still didn't understand. And I find it very interesting that Pastor Jay this morning talked about doors and talked about sometimes God's going to ask us to walk through a door that maybe we don't understand. And sometimes God asks us to do something that maybe we understand and maybe we get it. Maybe we don't see the full picture, but we're like, okay, everybody around us doesn't get it. And now we're walking through a door that God has called us to walk through, and we're doing it by ourselves because it's only you and Jesus. Because maybe your kids don't really get what you're doing, and maybe your spouse doesn't really get what you're doing, and, or, or you feel, right, sometimes we feel as though nobody else gets it. We have to remember our feelings lie to us, right? But sometimes God asks us to walk through that door, and we do it on our own. And that's not always a bad thing. Hannah persevered through the hard, right? Hannah persevered through nobody understanding her heart's cry for a child. I'd be willing to bet that there are some women in this room that know exactly what Hannah walked through. Because you desired something for so long. I know I walked through this. I desired something. I knew God told me when I was a child that I would be a mom. And then the doctors and my body <laughs> tried to tell me that that would never happen. And you feel alone and you feel isolated and you think you're the only one going through it. But Hannah did the right thing. And she said, God, I need you. I'm struggling right now. God, don't forget me. I don't understand this crushing. We talked about, did Pastor Jay talk about that? I heard a message from Christine Kane. Um, I actually left now on Facebook. And she just said that sometimes 
God will take, well, all the time. We just don't like it. And we're, we're, we're that grape, and we have to go through this crushing so that he can make us into brand new wine. But we don't like the crushing part. We don't, we don't like that part because that part hurts, right? <laughs> that part's not fun. But that's the part that makes us better. That's the part that draws us to our Jesus. That's the part that when sometimes we're waiting for that doctor's report or sometimes we got that doctor's report and we don't like it or sometimes we're unemployed for a little longer than we want it to be or sometimes we're told we can't have children and there's this crushing that happens and we want to complain and we want to get on social media and we want to talk about how it's not fair and we want to we want to yell at everybody, right? We want to get mad about it. We want to be upset about it. This isn't fair. My life isn't fair. I'm clearly the only person who's going through this. And yet God says, baby, come to me. Let me continue to do this in your life because I got something so much better. You are going to be a sweet aroma. I don't drink wine, so I've only seen this. So I'm assuming it's true. I've seen it in movies or they're like make fun of y'all. When you see somebody take wine that's supposed to be like really old and really awesome, what's the first thing they do? Yeah. How's that the first thing? It's not even in your mouth. You swirl, and then what? You smell it. God is creating you to be a sweet aroma, and you're fighting him the whole time because you feel alone, because you feel like it's not fair, because it hurts. And God is saying, if you would just draw to me, that's what Hannah did. Hannah said, God, I'm not going anywhere. I don't care if everybody thinks I'm crazy, but I'm going to cry out to you. And it's not about looking crazy. It's about her relationship with God. It was about her relationship with God. And she said, God, I'm going to go all in. (laughs) Come on. And I'm going to press through. Even when it hurts. Even when it's unfair. Even when this this doesn't make any sense to me. But I'm going to press through, God. Because I know you're doing a crushing. And I know that you're going to make something sweet out of this. Even when I don't understand the why, he's still going to make something sweet out of this. I don't know what your crushing looks like today, but he does. And he's holding you. Even when it doesn't feel like it, he's holding you in the palm of his hand. He's got his big daddy arms wrapped all around you. Even men, come on. He's got his big daddy's arms because you're not too big for him. You're not too big for him. He's got his big daddy arms wrapped around you, and he's like, you got this. I will not leave you, and I will not forsake you. And sometimes when we're walking through that, we still feel forgotten, right? Well, I want you to look at Mark 5, 21 through 36. And it's going to be on there. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to give you the, the story behind it. So have you anybody heard of the, the woman with the issue of blood in the Bible, in Mark? Yes? Have you heard of Jairus? So is what's happening here is Jairus comes to Jesus because he knows that his daughter is dying. And he knows that Jesus can heal her. He doesn't think that maybe Jesus can heal her. He knows that Jesus can heal her. How many times do we say, yeah, I think he could heal me. Or I have this ailment, and, and I don't really know how to, how to, doctors don't really know how to help me, or, or it's a really scary process, but I, I'm going to pray. I, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I'm going to pray. No, he knew. He knew that Jesus, all he had to do was say the word, and his daughter would be healed. So here is a man, here is a dad who is desperate because his daughter is literally dying. And there's desperation. I envision him running. I envision him saying, I don't care how many miles I have to run to get to Jesus to ask him to come and to touch my daughter. I don't care how long it takes, but I'm going to go. We care how long it takes in America, don't we? If Jesus doesn't show up right away or heal my body right away or heal my body the way I expect him to heal my body or to heal my mind or to heal my thoughts, then I get frustrated, I get annoyed, and I'm out which is probably one of the reasons why God says, uh, Jesus says in his word that most will grow cold at the end because we're a bunch of impatient people. 
And if Jesus doesn't show up the way I expect Jesus to show up, because now all of a sudden I've got it in my head that I'm God, and I know what's best, right? If he doesn't show up the way I expect him to show up, then I'm out, Jesus. Good try. But I'm out. So here's Jairus, and he says, you know what? I know God can heal, and I'm going to do whatever it takes, and I'm going to go forever how long I have to go in order to get to Jesus because I need my daughter healed. And so Jairus goes, and Jairus finds Jesus, and Jesus says, yeah, let's go. Let's, let's do this. I'm with you. You know a great feeling when you're, like, worshiping Jesus or you're in his word, and he brings you something, and you're like, oh, I can stand on this word. Oh, this this feels good, right? Come on, Jesus. This one feels good. Ooh, this is, this is a worship song I like. Come on. I got saved off of this worship song. Oh, this is a good one right here. The Holy Spirit is here today because I like this song. No? Okay, just me. Um, right? So, so so Jesus says, let's go. And they're they're going. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops. And he's like, whoa, hold up. Okay, so here's my, like, I try to, like, see things in my head because I'm a very visual person. And Pastor Amanda would say amen. I think sometimes I annoy her. But that's okay. I love you, Pastor Amanda, if you're watching this. And so I envision, like, <laughs> you're just like, Jesus, could you go a little faster? You, you want to run? I'm with you. Right? Because he's, like, ready to get to his daughter. Right? And, and all of a sudden, Jesus, like, stops. And if I'm, if I'm Jairus, I'm like, hey, um, yeah, why are we stopping? Because this is, like, my daughter. Like, this is the most important thing because this is my daughter, right? My situation is the most important situation. Oh, just me again? Okay, cool. So Jesus stops, and he says, who touched me? And Jairus is like, I don't know who touched you. I will hold your hand, though. Let's run. Come on. We got somewhere to go, right? That, that would be me. I don't know about you guys. But if my Bella was laying on the bed dying, I'd be like, I don't care who touched you. We are on a journey. We are on our way to go get heal my, I don't, this doesn't matter to me. How many of us do that in life? I'm worried about my issue. Come on. I'm worried about my problem. I'm worried about Jesus hasn't healed my body. I'm frustrated because X, Y, and Z isn't working out in my life. So y'all are going to have to hold on until I get figured out. Because I can't do this because I'm too focused here. And so Jairus is, a. I, and now the word doesn't say this. The word doesn't say that Jairus kind of freaked out. But he's human, right? Like, I think humans, we just kind of like, what, wait, wait a minute. Why isn't this about me right now? And so Jesus stops and he said, who touched me? And I heard a, a really great preacher one time with my husband. And he said, that the Bible is funny because Jesus is being, like, kind of sarcastic, and he's like, what do you mean? Or his disciples were like, Jesus, there's a million people standing around you. What do you mean who touched you? Like, lots of people touched you. And Jesus says, no. I felt healing power come out of my body. Because somebody was so desperate, and they had nothing else, and the faith to say, if I can just touch his cloak. I don't even have to touch Jesus. I just want to touch the hem of his garment. If I can just touch the tiny little piece, I know he will heal me. I don't, I don't even have to talk to him. He doesn't have to give me encouraging words. He doesn't have to tell me that I'm the best thing since sliced bread. He doesn't have to tell me that, that you know what, honey, you, you, this is unfair. You should not have to walk through this. 12 years of bleeding, that's unfair. She doesn't look as nice. Matter of fact, she didn't even really want to be seen, right? She's like, I'm just going to, I'm going to crawl on the ground. I can just touch the hem of his garment. I know he will heal me. Just, just this tiny little piece of Jesus is all I need because I know that he will heal me. What did Jesus say to her? faith. I don't know God hasn't healed you because you lack faith. I don't know that. I can't be that judge. It's not my job. But what I do learn with this is this. Jesus is walking. He says, your faith has healed you. He even says, your son's faith. Remember the guy who was dropped through the roof? He said, your son's faith. It makes me wonder if this man laying there was like, guys, seriously, you're going to run me through a roof? Like, no. How many times do your friends tell you to do? You're like, no. 
no, I'm not, I'm not going to that. No, I'm not doing that. No. And your friends are like, come on, you got to do this. Jesus is like, you got to be there. And you're like, I'm good, no. I'm wondering if he was maybe like, you know what, I'm, I'm okay where I am. I'm comfortable where I am. Do you think maybe Jesus could come to me because, you know, the house is really full and I get really anxious when I get around a lot of people? I, I need Jesus to, to come to me because that makes me nervous. Sometimes when you grab your wife's hand or your husband's hand or your friend's hand and say, you know what, it's okay. Let's go be nervous together. Let's go meet Jesus together. Too many times we say, you know what, yeah, anxiety's hard. You, you sit right there and we'll see if Jesus shows up. God's been saying to us for months to move. So Jairus is, is, I would imagine, anticipating Jesus to, to have this moment quickly and then to move on, right? That would be me. I'd be like, come on, come on, Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jairus' buddy shows up and is like, your daughter's dead. Leave the master alone. Your daughter's dead. And I don't know about you, but in that moment, I would have felt forgotten by God. I would have felt like, Jesus, I've made you look kind of weak. And now it's too late. Jesus, do you know how far I ran? <laughs> Jesus, do you know how hard this was to get here? And now my daughter's dead. And now my diagnosis is really scary. And now I might be dying. Are you kidding me, Jesus? In that moment, I would have felt forgotten. In that moment, I would have felt like Jesus didn't really care. And that's just being honest and real. And I think a lot of us in this room would probably raise your hand and say, I, I think I would probably feel the same way. We want to say, because we're believers, right? We're Christians. We want to say, Psh, Pastor Jen. I've been like, um, hey, Jesus, so like I have super tons of faith. And so let's let's just keep going and see what happens, right? You try to like fabricate your faith. <laughs> you try to say, nope, nope, I'm, I, nope, I, we, we got this. Your daughter gets sick. And you don't know, we know the story, right? We know what happens. Jairus didn't know what would happen. All Jairus knows is the daughter is dead. And he doesn't even know why he did so, to hold her hand. And to brush back her hair and say, baby, go. Your daughter's dead. And I think it's, it disappointed him. I'll be willing to bet a lot of us in this room have felt very disappointed by God's choices. God chose in that moment, Jesus chose in that moment to stop and to love on a woman. And in that moment, Jairus lost his daughter. But don't say, don't Jesus. In the midst of the hard, in the midst of the waiting, in the midst of the not understanding, in the midst of death, in the midst of cancer, in the midst of a child, um, a miscarriage, in the midst of maybe being told you're not going to have babies, in the midst, Jesus said, come on, Jairus. Now, Jesus, I envision Jesus going, come on, buddy. Come on. Before Jesus was, Jairus was like, come on, Jesus, let's go. And Jesus was like, hold on, hold on. And now, I see Jesus taking Jairus' hand and saying, come on. And if I'm Jairus, I'm going, Jesus, it's too late. You were too busy. <laughs> you weren't here when I needed me, right? When I needed you because we as humans don't see the bigger picture, right? The word says that uh, his ways are not our ways and our thoughts are not his thoughts. We don't have to understand it. We do not have to understand it. 
I lost my mother-in-law 10 years ago, and I don't understand it. And it hurts, and it's not fair. (laughs) And it doesn't get easier. You just learn to keep doing life without them. I don't understand. I showed up at a hospital when a friend of mine who I had gone to her doctor's appointments and I had seen that baby on the ultrasound and that baby came out dead. I don't understand that. I don't have an answer for you. I don't get it. I don't know why I had to stand and and have an open casket and see this baby. I don't understand those moments. I could stand here and I could question God all day long or I could say, Jesus, you are faithful. And in the midst of my not understanding and in the midst of the heart and in the midst of the pain, I'm going to keep serving you and I'm going to keep trusting you. Even if I never understand it. I don't know that Hannah ever understood why she was in the place that she was in. I don't know if the woman with the issue of blood really understood. God, what was the point of this? I'm good not being mentioned in the Bible. I don't want to bleed for 12 years. What's the point of this? And she could have sat back home on her dirt ground and said, you know what? Yeah, Jesus is passing by, but you know what? This was unfair. This is unfair that I have this. So Jesus can go ahead and pass on by. Or she can get on her hands and knees and say, Jesus, touch the hem of your garment. I know you will heal me. I don't understand it. I don't get this. And it is unfair. But I know if I can just get my hand in your garment, if I will just press through, if I will just choose to be all in, if I will read my word and I will seek his face, it may not come in your time. It may not come in your lifetime. And your healing might be heaven. Your healing may not be here on earth. I don't understand that, except for the fall. That's the only thing I can go back to is Adam and Eve. Just so you know, that wasn't God's fault. Sin is sin. And Jesus is God and love and mercy and healing and faithfulness and gentleness and kindness. And when I am faithless, Second Timothy says that he remains faithful. So when I'm a hot mess, and I shouldn't even be on this stage preaching because I got all sorts of crazy things going on in my brain, and things aren't super easy, and we put up, you know, like, yeah, life is great. It's fun being a pastor. Woohoo! Uh, I shouldn't be on this stage, but because God is bigger, and because God is faithful regardless of my faithfulness, and because God had a word for all of us in this place, he's going to say, you know what, Jen, even though you're a broken vessel, I'm still going to pour into you, and I'm still going to use you. Just like he is going to pour into each uh, broken vessel in this room. And he says, let me fill you. Be in my word. Seek my face, and I will fill you, and I will allow you to pour out into others, and I will pour into you. Just reach for the hem of my garment. That's it. Just reach for the hem of my garment. So most of you probably know how the story ends. But Jesus goes with Jairus because Jesus loves Jairus. Because Jesus loves Jairus' daughter and Jairus' wife. And Jesus wants to heal us. Jesus wants to see the joy. And so he goes and he says, everybody's mourning. They're like, it's too late. It, it's too late. To me, excuse me, that shows Jesus had to clear everybody out, right? Do you remember this? He's like, y'all need to go. I think it's because there wasn't faith. Everybody had given up. He's like, I can't have this here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something really crazy and amazing. And, and y'all aren't going to understand it. So I need, I need you to clear the room. Sometimes God says, I want to do something really cool and amazing. Sometimes he just can't because we're not ready for it. 
Sometimes he can't because we've been too busy on social media. Sometimes he can't because we've been too busy complaining to so-and-so that, well, God's not faithful. Well, if God was truly God, then he would have healed me from this already. Well, if God really loved me, I wouldn't have gone through that divorce or three divorces. If God really loved me, that man would not have taken advantage of me. If God really loved me, I wouldn't have been sexually molested by babysitters when I was eight years old or an uncle. If God really loved me, right? And so I believe that in that room, there were people standing there and they said, well, Jesus didn't show up. So Jesus doesn't care. Jesus tells me when I'm a child that you will be a mom. Now I'm married and three years have gone by and I'm not a mom. Well, that wasn't real, Jesus. What are you doing, Jesus? What's your plan here? Because I'm not seeing it. Can I just tell you, it's okay to be mad at God. It's okay to question God. Okay? So when you're mad, you're hurt, you're frustrated, you can cry out and be like, listen, I'm ticked right now, and I don't understand what's going on, and I, I, I'm mad. I don't know why the doctors are telling me I can't have babies, and that's a promise you gave me. I don't understand why I, I'm diagnosed with whatever it is. I don't understand this. This wasn't in the plan. The door? It's okay to say, God, I, I'm hurt. This is hard. I don't understand. And in that questioning and in that frustration, I would encourage you to walk through those emotions with him and then allow him to love you. Allow him to say to you, hey, you may never understand this, but I need you to trust me. Your outcome may not be what you thought it would be, but I need you to trust me. Do you trust him? Because Jesus said to Jairus, Jairus, I got you. You doubt so quickly. Let, let, me, let, me, let me be Jesus. Let me be your daddy. I got you. Don't you think that I love this baby girl more than you do? I got you. So Jesus shows up, and he, and he heals this little girl, and she stands up. And it's joyous, and everybody is happy and excited, but not everybody got to see the miracle. Not everybody was in that room and got to see the miracle. They got to see the aftermath, right? They got to see afterwards. But not everybody got to be in the room to see the miracle. Because not everybody believed that Jesus was really Jesus and that Jesus was going to show up in a really amazing way. Jesus is not... <laughs> I know there are people in this room that... that haven't made that full decision to serve him 100%. I just want you to know that Jesus isn't mad at you. As a matter of fact, he loves you so incredibly much. And he is not mad at you. And he's not sitting up in heaven like some of us think on a throne with his arms crossed saying, you know, if you wouldn't have. You know what he's doing? He's probably sitting right next to you. And he's probably got his arm around you, and he's saying, listen, it's okay that you're not perfect. That's why I had to come and die on the cross. I got all this grace and love and mercy for you. It's really cool. All you have to do is receive it. It's totally free. He's not sitting here. I sat in the front row this morning, and I said, God, <laughs> I'm a mess. And you know what he said to me? He said, that's okay, because I'm not. And I've called you, and you have a purpose, and you have a plan. And Jen, I don't change. Jen, I knew that you were going to be here, and you were going to preach this message. And I also knew that you'd be struggling in your mind. I still called you to preach. I still called you. I still have a purpose and a plan. And he had to remind me of that. Guys, like two minutes before I was, came up to, to preach. Because in my own mind, I'm like, God, I'm so unworthy. God, why, why are we doing this right now? Like, I'm just going to hand the mic to Dan. Like, he's good, off the cuff. Like, it'll be fine. And Jesus says, Jen, no, it's not. Only your thoughts and your mind is, is what you're, you're creating a different God than who I am. 
I am creating a different God than who he says he is because of my thoughts, because of my journey, because of the things that have happened to me or haven't happened to me or the, what I thought should or shouldn't. And so I begin to say, well, God, you're, you, you don't really want this. You don't really want this on the stage in front of all your people, Jesus. You don't really want this woman to be the mom of those three amazing kids because I'm, I'm a mess. God, I just, and we create him to be somebody that he's really not in our own minds. And this is why being in his word and knowing what he says about you is so important. I preach this to my kids all the time, my youth kids. Every week I say it at least once. You've got to be in your word because that is how you know who you are in him. If you're not in your word, then you create a different God. And then when you say, I serve Jesus, no, you serve a thought of who you think Jesus is. But you're not actually serving Jesus. <laughs> because if we were actually serving Jesus, guess what? We would walk in freedom. We would walk in a way that when people looked at us, they'd be like, I, I, I need to know that person. Why do you love me? Why do you treat me so good? Well, I... Jesus, I don't know. Like, I just love Jesus. Because I'm serving the Jesus of the Bible. I'm serving what the Word of God says Jesus is. And, y'all, I'm not preaching something that I'm not. I, I struggle at living this. I think we all do because our minds take over, right? <laughs> so I'm not preaching something that I've perfected. Please know that. I'm a hot mess. But when we begin to worship the one that is not who the Word of God says is, and we worship the one that we've created in our own minds. And then we sit back and go, well, why doesn't anybody want to come to my church? Well, well, I tell people about Jesus. Why don't they want him? Because you don't live in freedom, my friend. Because you don't live a life that they would look at and say, I need some of that. Your life looks exactly like the unbeliever's life. And until we get that figured out, and until we truly begin to worship the Jesus in the Bible... Revival won't come, or revival will come, but not here, and it will pass us up, because revival can't, Jesus isn't going to show up and be like, you can't handle, <laughs> I can't even think of that movie, you can't handle the truth. He wants to be in a place where we know who he is, and until we get in our word, and until we're worshiping the Jesus of the Bible, we're not there. So let's read some scripture verses. Psalm 94, 14. For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake. Is that up there? Uh, he will never forsake his inheritance. You are his inheritance. He will never forsake you. Let me say that. Again. You are his inheritance. You. You. You are his inheritance. Psalm 37, 25. Once I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. He's got you. His word also says this one isn't here, but it also says that if he's going to take care of the birds of the air and he's going to clothe the lilies of the valley, why in the world would he not take care of you? Now listen. Listen. Sometimes Jesus is doing his very best to take care of you, and we hinder him. But Jesus, I've been praying, and I need a new job, or Jesus, I've been praying, and we need more food, or Jesus, I've been praying, and I need a new apartment. Jesus, I've been praying. But you haven't really been doing the things that God's called you to do. Now, his love is not based on conditions, and if you do this, I will bless you. But I will say it goes back to that crushing. And God wants to make you a sweet aroma. But sometimes we want to sit around and complain. Instead of allowing God to bless us, we want to complain about it. And God's like, I want to bless you, but you're making it really hard. Have you done that with your kids? I want to give you the world. I want to take care of, of whatever it is. I want to bless you. I want to provide for you. I want to take you out for ice cream. I want to whatever it is. But you're making it really hard. Right? Whether it's the attitude. How many parents say amen? All right. Do you ever think God looks and goes, baby, I want to bless you, 
but your attitude's making it really hard. Honey, I want to bless you, but you're not really loving your siblings like you should be. We're a family, right? Body of Christ, we're a family. So I love you, but you're not loving your siblings. I want to bless you, but you're not loving like you, like you need to love. You're not serving like you need to serve. I've, I've called you to, to serve. I've called you to step out, and you're not doing what I've asked you to do. I want to bless you. But your obedience is better than your sacrifice. I don't want to have to sacrifice. I want to just be obedient. You know where that scripture is from? Because I know it's in the word. Is it 1 Samuel? No? You don't know? Okay. <laughs> the Bible says that your obedience is better than your sacrifice, which means that when God tells me to do something and I do it, that is way better than Jesus having or God having to come along and be like, Okay, so now we have to kind of process this, and we kind of have to deal with your disobedience. Does that make sense? And he does that because he loves us. He's not doing that to slap us on the hand and to be like, okay, well, I guess we'll go ahead and do that now. He's doing it because he loves us. I'm getting, I'm getting off track. Okay, 1 Samuel 12, 22. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people because the Lord, has pl- w- the Lord was pleased to make you his own. Because of who he is, he won't forsake you. So if you weren't in his inheritance, and you were just, uh, there are just some people that came out of the dust, it's whatever. If that's what it was, which it's not, but if that's what it was, he still wouldn't forsake you because of his name. <laughs> we, ooh, I don't think y'all are getting this. Woo, okay. Because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. If you doubt God's love for you, get in your word. And if you're not sure where to read how much he loves you, then Google it. And say, scripture, God's love for me. And you'll have about 500 verses, okay, maybe not that way, but a lot of verses that will come up. You can even read them right there on the screen. Or you could be like adventurous and get out your paper Bible and read it. And then you could highlight it. By the way, if anybody wants to bless me, listen, look at this. All of Genesis is gone. And most of Exodus. I have the pages. I just can't find anybody to fix it. So, there you go. I need my Bible fix. Okay. The rest is sitting on my desk at home because I didn't need it for this particular message. Okay. Deuteronomy. For the, uh, 431, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon you. You? I don't know what that was. He will not abandon you or destroy you or forget the solemn covenant he made with your ancestors. He will not forget about you. When you feel forgotten and you feel like he's not answering you and you feel like you don't understand what's going on, his word, oh, look at there, his word Let me say it one more time because I I don't think y'all got. His word says that he has not forgotten you and he has not forsaken you. So when you feel, because our feelings lie to us, when you feel, when I feel like the whole world is crumbling down and I don't understand what's going on, get in your word. I had somebody say to me, it was in mine and Dan's journey of waiting. And um, somebody asked me like how I was doing or whatever. And I said, you know, I said there are really hard days. And there are really good days. I said, but you know what the waiting is doing? It's drawing me to my Jesus. And you know what this person said to me? They said, that's religious. And I said, what? And they're like, if you need something to draw you to Jesus, there's something wrong. I said, oh, no, no, no. If my waiting on him is going to allow me to get closer to him, then you know what happens when I get closer to Jesus? I get in his word more. You know what happens when I get in his word more? I get more truth. You know what happens when I get more truth? All of a sudden, the junk up here that I'm telling myself begins to change. And now you know what's happening? Now I'm living my life a little different. Oh, now I actually look like a Christian who loves Jesus, who believes in the word of God. Right? Because sometimes, because God knows that we are human and we are a hot mess, I like that, um, that we need a little push. We need a little, come on, baby girl. 
Come on, big boy. I know you think you got it all together, but come on. I'm going to help you along. I don't have a God voice, otherwise I would use it. My kids say I have a man voice, but it's only when I'm mad. Then they say I become the Hulk. I'm okay with it. <laughs> if they listen and it keeps them out of hell, I'm okay being the Hulk. I'm just saying. Um, oh, was that, was that too much? Sorry. Okay. Um, I'll go back to reading scripture. Okay. Uh, let's see, where are we? Deuteronomy 31.6. So be strong and courageous. See, Hulk. That's what I'm saying. Strong. Okay, no? Okay. Um, so be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before him. Do I even need to preach that? So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before him. Why? Because he's got you. You think Jairus panicked a little bit when, the, when his uh, buddy came over and said, hey, um, your daughter's already dead. Leave the master alone. And Jesus said, don't worry. She's not going to hurt you. It's okay. Walk with me. It's going to be okay. You know, what's, you know what's interesting is Jesus didn't say to Jairus, let's go because I'm going to heal your daughter. He didn't say that. He said, let's go. Jairus had to trust that whatever Jesus was going to do was going to be good. We know the story. Jairus didn't. All he knew is his daughter was now dead, and Jesus says, let's go. I'm like, it's too late. The word says, don't panic. Don't panic. Don't freak out. Don't, don't worry. Sorry, I get excited. Um, do not panic before them, for the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. If you are questioning God's love for you, or if you are questioning whether or not he is there for you, I'm going to say it again because I've been told that when you repeat something lots of times, that's the only time we actually get it. So I'm going to encourage you to get in your word. And this is Old Testament. Oh, my bad. Okay, Dan told me not to go there. Okay. Are you sure? Okay. Um, Deuteronomy, this is all like, okay. Deuteronomy 31, 8. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Oh, I'm sorry. 31 and 6. Oh, and 31, 8. Just in case you didn't hear it, Jesus is like, God's like, let me help you out. Because a few verses later, I'm going to repeat myself. Do you ever have to repeat yourself to your children? Can you please, please stop? Ian, I'm right here. You don't have to yell. What, Mom? Ian, I am right here, baby. You don't. But, Mom, I got to tell you something really important. Okay, baby, but I'm right here. You don't have to yell. Yeah, but, Mom, you got to hear. Baby, stop yelling at me, right? Hulk is about to come out, baby. You got to stop. And then there are those moments where it's like, hey, Ian, um, you know Jesus loves you, right? Jesus, you, Ian, you know, you know Jesus died on the cross for you, right? You know that nobody else loves you as much as Jesus. Yes, Mommy, I know. I give my heart to Jesus. Oh, yes. And then two days later, hey, Ian, you know Jesus loves you, right? Ian, you know Mommy loves you and Daddy loves you. Yes, Mommy. Yeah, you tell me. You tell me. I know. Okay. But you know Jesus died on the cross for you, baby, right? Yes, Mommy. I tell him, and I tell all my children, over and over and over again, because it's important. I want them to know. And I'm sure you moms and dads do the same thing to your babies. You know Jesus loves you, right? You know I love you, right? You know there's nothing you could do that would ever make me so angry that I would stop loving you, right? You know there's nothing you could do that would ever make Jesus stop loving you, right? Because Romans tells us in 8 that nothing can separate us from his love. Nothing. Nothing, not even ourselves, not even us walking away will separate us from his love. Now, we may not get the benefits because we've walked away, but it doesn't separate us from his love. You in this room who maybe haven't made the choice to be all in with Jesus and to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior, that doesn't separate you from his love. He's still crazy about you. You, you can't get away from his love. So I tell my children this stuff. Why? Because it's important. Jesus, he's telling them. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never abandon you. Even when your emotions tell you that I have. Even when the world tells you that I have. 
Maybe your best friend has told you that I have. He says, I will never. Not I might once in a while when you really irritate me. Right? He doesn't say that. He says, I will never. Never. Even in our stupid choices. No, just me again? Okay, cool. So he will never leave us nor forsake us. So whatever you're going through in this room today, or maybe on Facebook, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, I believe that Jesus just wants to say to you that he loves you, he's got you, to trust him, to get in his word so he can tell you how much he loves you. Right? That's where you're going to hear it. That's where you're going to read it. That's where you're going to see it in his word. I love the Bible app. I love that there are devotions on there and I can read those. But here's the thing. Somebody else's opinion of the word is not you reading the word. (laughs) Because sometimes God has something really specific that he wants to say to just you. Because you, he sings over you at night. I don't know if you know this. But the word of God says that he dances over us and that he sings over us. I don't know about you, but I, like, when my kids are asleep, I'm like, sweet, I'm going, I'm going to bed. Like, I ain't dancing over nobody, right? I'm like, I'm tired. I ain't dancing over no. I've had a long day. There's no dancing or singing. <laughs> but Jesus is like, oh, did you see my girl today? She just stayed home and loved on her babies. But man, she loved her babies well. Did you see my son today? Today was a hard day. He struggled. I wanted to speak life to him today. So much I wanted to tell him. I was so hoping he would just open the word. There's so much in there that I wanted to tell him. Yeah, I miss you, buddy. But I'm still going to sing over you. And I'm still going to dance over you. And tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to get up. Tomorrow I will tell him. He loves you. He sings over you. He dances over you. You exalt him. You make his heart happy. Even when you do the wrong thing, you make his heart happy. Even when you're mad at him, you make his heart happy. And that's amazing. That's amazing. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you dance over me. I thank you that you dance over us. God, I thank you that you are not the God that I've created in my own mind. Thank you for being so much bigger and more better and more amazing than anything I could even fathom, Lord. Thank you for stretching us and crushing us so that we can be a sweet aroma to them. Oh, I thank you for peace that surpasses all understanding. So when I feel like, God, I should be a mess because I've had bad news or things aren't going my way, God, your peace covers it all. And even in the midst of my crazy, in the midst of the weird, even in the midst of the unknown, God, you are peace. I call you for peace. worship you this morning, God, and I thank you for who you are. And I pray over your people today, God, that wherever they are today, God, 
that you had drenched them with your love. That your peace would rain upon their heads, God, and it would soak them in your presence, Lord God. Father, I pray that people would not leave the way they walked in today, God. But God, that today, Father, may become a sweet aroma. That today, Jesus, God, that you would do a work in our hearts and in our minds, Father, to begin the process of the change, Father, that we serve, God. Not what's in our head, but what's in your word. God, I pray as we go about our busy day and as we celebrate moms, Father, that you would remind us of this before we lay down on our pillow to worship you, to be in your word. God, as we seek you, we will find you. We've promised it, Jesus. We love you, Mom. Amen. Holy smokes. I just need to say I've preached that passage in a hundred times, if not more. Weddings, funerals, youth groups, retreats, bowling yards. And I never saw some of the things that the Holy Spirit just put on Jen's heart that she pulled out of that. How about this? Not everybody's going to see your miracle because some people didn't believe in your miracle. How about this? Uh, we're not worshiping Jesus because we've created someone different than he really is. Mike, was that good? That was tough. By the way, babe, there's your book, just so you know. There's your book. Hey, um, powerful morning. If, if, if you are disconnected uh, today uh, and you are like, man, I'm not sure where that hit me. Uh, go back and watch this at home off our Facebook when it's just the quietness of you and the Holy Spirit because there was so many nuggets in that uh, 47 minutes of just goodness. I have no idea if it was 47 minutes. Uh, th just so many nuggets of just truth. Uh, I believe this with all of my heart. Those that are in the teaching positions here at Cornerstone Church have some incredible insight from the Holy Spirit. And, and you saw that today. Uh, amen. Amen, baby. Happy Mother's Day. Phenomenal job. Phenomenal. Hey, we're going to close the service this way. Uh, we're going to give it a shot one more time on what our kids have to say to their moms. If it doesn't work through our system, we have another way. So if there's a little botchery there, you'll, it'll be okay. Give us about 10 seconds of silence, which will feel like five minutes, but it's really only 10 seconds. And then we'll do that. If that doesn't work, uh, then I'm not going to get paid next month. And we're going to go get a whole new computer system back there because I'm done. Amen. Praise the Lord. There's two things that ruin churches. Well, there's lots of things that ruin churches, but two that ruin them the quickest are putting your name on the side of your van. Okay, that will just, it just ruins the van right there. And then sound systems, the bane of every church. Come on, somebody laugh and smile and act like you like being in church. All right, give it up for our kids this week. What do you guys love about your mom? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing about my mom probably is always her like positive energy that she gives us. Um, like for me, especially when I'm dancing, she always comes backstage with me before I have to compete. So she's really like gives me a good build up before I have to go on stage and like sends positive energy. My favorite thing about my mom is that she's always there for me whenever I need her. She's really nice and she, she always loves us and I think it's great that she's always driving us to and from church and taking the time to care for us. Taking us out for dinner and getting us presents. My mom's nice. She helps us when we need help. And she um, takes care of us really well. She provides us with all our needs and she's very loving and caring. My favorite thing is that no matter what we've done or like what we're going through, she's always right there to just love on us. So even when we have a bad dream or we disobey her, she's still right there and loves us. Kanan, what do you love about your mom? Snuggling. Snuggling? <laughs> what do you like to do with mom? What do you and mom do? Shoes. Yeah? Shoes. Shoes? No, shoes. Oh, okay. Well, she does really a lot of nice kind of things to us. Like, she always is like doing dishes a lot and when we really don't want to, that's most of the thing. We really it's basically all the dishes. I love that um, she 
just, um, it's just really nice all the time in that she's always thinking of other people. Well, she does a lot of things for us. Uh, she's amazing. She loves us very much, and she goes and brings us a lot of to a lot of places. She gives me a lot of hugs, and she brings us to the grocery store. Um, she matches all the time. She matches sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. What's your favorite thing about mom? That she's um, silly. And I like cake cats, and my mom um, is so the best, and I love her so much. I love my mom because she makes good food. She's always there for me. She's supported me since I was a baby, and she is pretty much a good mom that gives good advice when I am feeling down or having a bad day, and she's just the best mom that I could always have. Um, I like how she goes out of her way a lot to help me or do things that we need, especially for like rides and stuff because we're both really busy with after school activities and stuff and she's always there and she's always helping us and supporting us. Yeah, she always gives rides to us for like me with sports and stuff like that. Uh, she's always making food and always planning like family vacations, always getting discounts. <laughs> and she's like always there. Like if something happens, she's just there. She usually lets me play the PlayStation when I want. I like Fortnite. Love you, Mom. I 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 love you, Mommy. I love you, Mommy. <laughs>